selected manner so that we can periodically go back and evaluate their performance against the performance of birds that we're raising today. So if we look here, um, here's a picture of a 1950 broiler, which has been maintained at the University of Georgia, the, the <coughs> Athens Canadian random bred bird, versus uh, a Ross 308 bird from just a few years ago. So you can see here tremendous improvement in, in a body size, body weight, and dramatically different in conformation. Probably the most remarkable picture, and I can't ever look at this picture without just saying, wow, is looking at the breast conformation and the amount of breast meat on an Athens Canadian random bread from the 1950s versus the current broiler, and this isn't even the current broiler, this is from a few years ago, at the same, at the same ages. Now, we've developed the bird for breast meat because that's what the consumer asked these geneticists to do. This, for the most part, in, in, at least in the United States, the breast meat is the most valuable, agree or not agree, but that is what's been asked for, and so we can see amazing changes in, in the rate of deposition of this muscle and also in the conformation of the bird. Absolutely extraordinary. So let's go back and look at and try to understand a little bit more about where this performance came from. Dr. Gerald Havenstein at North Carolina State University took on the project of examining where the birds were in 1950 compared to where they were in 2003, and this is a very important study that he did. Interestingly enough, Dr. Gerald Havenstein was the nutritionist at H&N, working for Art Heisdorf, when I got my first two dozen eggs from that company. So if we look at the growth rate and of the birds then and now, you can see in blue are modern birds at 42 days, at 56 days, and at 70 days. Okay? Those birds were fed a modern diet. So the typical diet of what we're using today. If we look at that same bird fed a 1957 ration, we still got good performance, but very different from the performance we would have expected if we were feeding a modern diet. Okay? Then let's look at the performance of the 1950 bird. This is the 1957 bird against the modern bird in gray. And this is the 1957 bird fed a 2001 diet, okay? So we're looking at them at day 42, 56, and 70. What this evaluation tells us is that the difference between the rate of growth of the birds fed the 1957 ration versus the more modern ration is that 10 to 15 percent of the improvement in growth rate and performance comes from nutrition. Okay? So definitely significant. The, the aspects of nutrition that have changed over the last 50 years <clears throat> and are responsible for that 10 to 15 percent improvement include methionine, lysine, vitamin D, a higher protein level, a higher energy level, and pelleting. Because in 1950s we were still feeding all MASH diets. All right, let's look at that same bird profile again. Day 42 current bird, and this is again fed the lower 1957's ration. But this time, let's look at the difference in performance between strictly the 1957 birds and the current birds. Based on that, and with what we know now about the, the improvement from nutrition, oops, we can say that 80 five to ninety percent of the improvement in performance in the modern broiler is from genetic selection. Okay? 
So we appreciate the contribution from nutrition, certainly, when nutrition is always on our mind because of the significant impact of feed cost to performance. But over the last 50 years, we really owe a vote of thanks to the geneticists who have supplied us with 85 to 90 percent of that improvement. I'm sure many of you have seen this, but I think this is also an interesting slide. This is the pyramid that shows us how we get from where we want to be to where we are today in terms of selecting the modern broiler. At the top of the pyramid is the primary breeder. Those are the companies that are making the selection, listening to the consumers, evaluating the problems in the field, and trying to make good decisions as to what the next broiler needs to look like. The important thing to notice here is that at the top of the pyramid is four years ago. So the broilers that we see in the field now were just being discussed and put on paper in 2010. So conversely, the birds that are in high level of selection today we won't see it as producers until 2018. So if you can corner one of the primary genetics company people and ask them, what do we expect to see in 2018? They just kind of give you a little turn up smile and a chuckle, but I think it's going to be amazing. Because the important thing to understand is the tremendous improvement we've seen in genetics, everybody says it has to stop, but apparently, there is no slowdown in sight, so there is still major changes on the horizon. The important thing to understand, too, is that originally broilers were selected for a single trait. They were selected for size. So if you had a big bird, you bred it to another bird that was big, and you hopefully got chicks that were bigger. But it's gotten to the point now where in order to maintain the quality bird that we're all used to growing now, it's really selection done on 30 to 60 individual traits. Certainly those traits include growth rate, feed efficiency, leg health, circulatory heart and lung health, egg production for those of us that have to have breeders as part of our responsibility, uh, hatchability. So there are a number of traits that have to be selected for in order to give us a complete package out in the field. So the primary breeder is making a decision here and they make a selection and they put a group together, a pedigree group together that consists of one male and ten females. That one male and ten females is then responsible for 150 grandparents, great-grandparents. Great those 150 grandparents in the next reproductive cycle, because obviously these birds have to be raised and then allowed eggs and then those eggs collected, are responsible for 7,500 GPs, grandparents. Those 7,500 GPs produce 375,000 parent stock. And for most of us, that have breeders, those would be the parent stock that we have that we use those eggs to, com to uh, produce commercial broilers. Those parent stock produce 48,750,000 broilers, which are responsible for nearly 70,000 metric tons of poultry meat. Okay? So it's a fascinating progression through selection and production of the genetics that we are so proud, all so proud to raise nowadays. As a result of the incredible increases in performance in broilers, we've seen an amazing rise in, in per capita consumption of broiler meat. And this is due to the fact that it is now available, and it's not just old tough hens and scrawny little roosters now, but fabulously good quality um, broiler meat. The other thing that's interesting is that the relative price of chicken meat today versus 1950 is nearly identical. 
So all of the amazing changes that we've seen in terms of production and genetic selection and efficiencies has resulted still in going from one of the most expensive proteins in the 1950s uh, to one of the cheapest now. But the relative price um, has changed very little over that 50 years, which is good for all of us. And we appreciate the fact that in the, in the Caribbean that the consumption even is higher than the consumption um, per capita in the United States. So let's go back to Herbert Hoover. Did he have the right idea? One chicken for every pot? Well, I would say that now, in 2014, he would be very proud to say that we all have 14 chickens in every pot. So quite a dramatic change um, from, and I'm sure, I'm not sure that Howard, uh, Herbert Hoover ever saw a chicken. All right, so I'm going to digress just a little bit and, and uh, talk to you about another issue that I think um, goes along with the performance and the production issue, and, and certainly one that affects all of us in the room. This is, <clears throat> this is a graph of what's happening agriculturally in the United States, and I'm sure it's not that different from countries around the world. We mentioned earlier that things began to happen in 1940, including urbanization of the country, meaning more people were moving away from the farms and moving to the cities. So you can see that a beginning about the 1940s, that the farms, the number of farms in the United States were starting to fall. The other thing that happened not long after that was during World War II, a lot of people were moved away from the farms. A lot of the men went into the military and the, a lot of farms ceased to exist because there was nobody to run them. Then we saw farm sizes increase because in order to feed the people, the farms that were left had to get bigger and had to become more efficient. So when we look at the people, the number of people from the United States that are involved in agriculture today, you can see that it's getting to be a very small number. And currently, less than 2% of everybody in the United States is directly involved in food. And so what we're seeing is a real change in the understanding of where people's food comes from. I think there's a real disconnect. Even if we go back to 1950, you can see that there was probably only 15% of the population of the United States involved in food production. That means that we now have generations, generations with an S, of people that have no understanding or no experience with food production. We were, I was having conversation this morning with, from somebody that had run into in Jamaica, had run into people that were arguing uh, vehemently about a vegan lifestyle. So apparently this type of misunderstanding um, and disconnect from food is happening around the world. How does that affect us as producers and especially poultry producers? I think that it's really important that we all understand that there is a magnifying glass on everything that we do. So our, the amazing performance improvements that we've all experienced and that we have all um, enjoyed in some cases have become very misunderstood. I think as a result, it is very imperative that as food producers, and especially as poultry producers, that we get, our, get the word out to people that don't have a good understanding about what we do. Biosecurity issues are paramount to maintain the health and integrity of our industry. The downside is that biosecurity and vertical integration, which has made us all very efficient but relatively small, has really isolated us from the world. Actually, we've isolated ourselves from the world and people don't know what we do. So as a result, they either listen to misinformation or they make things up. And it's unfortunate because I consider every poultry producer in this room to be a hero because I don't think there is anything <laughs> I truly don't believe that there is anything more honorable than being in the business of feeding people, especially in the poultry industry where we can supply 
high quality egg protein and high quality chicken protein to those people around the world and especially those that can afford it the least. So I salute you all for that. It doesn't mean it doesn't come without responsibility. Thank you. So one of the things that I wanted to get out today is a message because whenever there's a room full of people, I hope if I can educate one person, um, it will be helpful and hopefully we have the opportunity to get this message out. I'm sure it's the same here as it is in the United States. People say, I don't want to eat chicken, it's full of hormones. Even my mother says, don't eat the chicken neck, it's got hormones in it. I'm like, mother, please, okay? So let's talk about what, as producers, we need to do to get the word out that we, in fact, produce food based on fantastic genetic selection, nutritional development, and that's all. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about how to discuss this idea and hopefully convince people that chicken is safe. Hormones. If you go to the grocery store, I don't care where you go, look at all the beautiful labels. They're amazing. Okay? Look at those. Every one of those says no added hormones. Look at those. They don't say it. No wonder people are confused. Does that mean the ones in the green circles use hormones? I used to be really upset about the fact that people would put no added hormones on a chicken label because I feel it's deceptive to put something on a label that's not even an option. But you know what? We have to start thinking differently. Perception is reality. If people have the idea that we use hormones, then we all need to put on the label no added hormones, okay? It's taken me a long time to get to that, but I think now that it's important. Let's talk about the hormone issue. Hormones are illegal in chicken production. Hormones around the world are highly regulated for animal feeds and feeding. But in most countries and all countries that I'm aware of, feeding hormones to chickens is illegal. Hormone by itself does not result in increased growth. Growth hormone in a bunch of young men does not create a world-winning basketball team, okay? Growth is a very complicated metabolic process that requires a lot of things in order to be effective. And in chickens, growth hormone is not effective. Growth hormone, we're talking about growth hormone now, is a protein. It's very similar to insulin. It would look very similar to insulin. So anybody that is familiar with somebody that suffers from diabetes or certainly that you're aware of the fact that if you have diabetes, to, for insulin to be effective, it must be injected, okay? If we fed hormone, growth hormone to chickens, the intestinal tract would simply identify it as a, as a protein similar to the proteins in soy or corn and digest it. It would have no impact. So if we were to even consider using hormones in chickens, they would have to be injected, okay? The idea of getting up every morning and injecting millions or billions of chickens with hormone is a job that I don't think any of us want to even attempt to take on. In addition to that, growth hormone in chickens spikes every 90 minutes. So in order to even be effective, if it were to work, would mean that you would have to have multiple injections of growth hormone intravenously for it even to have a chance to work. It's hard enough to get birds caught where we're picking them up one time. I can't imagine trying to put together something where we're having to handle birds multiple times. Not only that, but the cost would be prohibitive. The cost of handling these birds over multiple times and the cost of one administration of hormone, if it were available, would be more than the cost of that carcass. There is no way financially that that could ever work. We've just spent 30 minutes talking about how we've worked so hard to, to grow and develop 
a broiler chicken that has fantastic performance. Those of you that are directly involved with broiler performance knows that sometimes we need to slow them down just a hair, okay? We don't always need them to grow as fast as they grow. We don't need any more help, okay? They grow fast enough as it is. If we were to artificially create additional growth, we would only end up with more metabolic problems like ascites, like heart attacks, sudden death, and leg problems than we have now. And another thing to consider is in the Caribbean with the hot, humid weather here, any additional metabolic growth would result in more issues with heat stress than what I'm sure you're faced with now. Because I'm sure that your 